Hi, and welcome to another episode of Piano TV, which happens to be a very special one, because it is our 100th episode! Insert fanfare! Today's video is all about the life and times of our good friend and composer Frederick Chopin, who was a Romantic era composer, meaning he was active in the 1800s, and he wrote a whole bunch of remarkable piano pieces, mainly piano, that was kind of like his forte. So we're going to talk about his life, his death, his loves and passions and personality and all that good stuff. So let's hop to it. Chopin was born on the 1st of March in 1810, and he lived until October 17th, 1849, which means he lived to the ripe old age of 39. So he was considered pretty sickly for most of his life, and the likely cause of his death was tuberculosis, which tended to take people early. Chopin, who we will henceforth refer to on a first name basis as Frederick, was born in Warsaw, Poland, and he spent the first half of his life there. The remaining half of his life he spent in Paris. Paris, sorry. Chopin was the only son to a Polish woman named Justina and a French man named Nicholas. He also had three sisters, one eldest and two younger, and he was quite close with his oldest sister, Ludwika. She was one of the few people who happened to show up at his deathbed, hanging out with him in those last months and last moments. Chopin studied piano, sorry, Frederick, studied piano from a young age, from about younger than age six with his mother, but officially with a teacher from age six and onwards, and was considered a child prodigy, like so many of these famous composers were. Frederick continued his musical education and at age 16 he joined the Warsaw Music Conservatory where he studied for three years subjects like theory and composition. So this whole time he was in school and in musical training he was writing music and he was composing music and he even performed for the Russian Emperor at the time so who gave him a diamond ring for his performance so I assume it must have been a fairly excellent performance. His final report card from the conservatory in 1829 said Chopin F, third year student, exceptional talent, musical genius. It's a pretty good report card. In addition to his schooling, Chopin also traveled a lot in his early years. He traveled to various places in Europe and performed and stuff. So at about age 20, he was like, you know what? I'm going to go set out into the world and I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to find a new place to live and go beyond my Polish upbringing. So that was kind of a fateful de decision because the year was 1830 and about a month after he set off from home, the November uprising occurred in Poland. So long story short, that was basically a rebellion that occurred between the Polish and the Russians. So the Polish were like, no, we're going to like be our own independent thing. And Russia's like, nah, -uh. so there was this big battle. Battle, and Ukraine and Belarus and Lithuania kind of helped out Poland a little bit, but in the end didn't end up working and Russia sort of absorbed Poland into its own empire. Because of this, Chopin ended up getting very nostalgic for his homeland and very upset, understandably crushed when he caught wind that the uprising was defeated in 1831. He's quoted as saying that he cursed the moment of his departure, like he wished he never left and abandoned his homeland. So even though he lived in France for roughly like the last 20 years of his life, he always considered himself Polish at heart, which he took very literally because on his, basically on his deathbed, he's like, Ludwika, good sister of mine, when I die, take my physical heart out of my body and put it in a jar of alcohol and take it back to Poland. And that's what she did. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. We're not quite at the death yet. Okay, so cut to Frederick arriving in Paris. He did some performances and immediately was really well received and he received a lot of praise, notably from Robert Schumann of great musical fame himself, who's quoted as saying in 1831, hats off gentlemen, a genius. Another music critic wrote in 1832, after a particularly notable performance that, here is a young man who, taking no model, has found, if not a complete renewal of piano music, an abundance of original ideas of a kind to be found nowhere else. So with high praise like that, it's no surprise that Chopin was a part of the French musical elite by the end of 1832, amongst others like Franz Liszt and Hector Berlioz. So speaking of Franz Liszt, he also went to that very fateful 1832 performance and he was quoted as saying, the most vigorous applause, this is my, this is my Franz Liszt voice because he's very passionate. The most vigorous applause seemed not to suffice to our enthusiasm in the presence of this talented musician who revealed a new phase of poetic sentiment combined with such happy innovation in the form of his art. Which is some pretty good praise. A little, little oversaid there, Liszt, but good praise nonetheless. 
Those two composers ended up becoming fast friends, and they even just lived a few blocks away from each other for many years. And they performed together, and so on and so on. But as with many friendships between contemporaries, it wasn't all roses. They had their ups and they had their downs. So Frederick was apparently a little bit jealous about Liszt's success and his like uh, energetic nature and his songwriting and his technique. So he could be like a little bit spiteful about that. And another thing that kind of made Frederick, well, really angry is that Liszt performed a nocturne that Chopin had wrote, but he added some little like frills and decorations and additions and Frederick was furious. He's like, you edited my song. He's like, play it the way it was meant to be played or don't play it at all, to which Liszt was forced to apologize. And then after that, their friendship was a little strained. And now, having arrived at about 1836, we gotta start talking about Frederick's love life. Notably, George Sand. Gotta talk about George Sand. So, not a boy. That was her pseudonym because she was a French writer, and I think she just preferred writing under a male alias, as did other women of the time. So, she was Chopin's lover for about nine years, and they had a very turbulent and very tumultuous relationship. She was also quite the character herself because, aside from assuming a male name, she also did other things that society at the time considered like very wild and masculine. Like, she wore men's clothes because she thought they were more comfortable. Like, what a, what a crazy concept. And she also smoked cigars, which was deemed unladylike. Okay, so here's the story. They met at a party at 1836. Chopin noticed her because she was very noticeable. She's very short. She's dark. She had big eyes. And she's probably, like, smoking a cigar. So his initial reaction was, like, is that even a woman? He, he was pretty confused. But eventually, they became friends. And two years later, they started, like, an official relationship. And George Sand herself is quoted as saying about Frederick. She says, I must say, I was confused and amazed at the effect this little creature had on me, because Chopin was like a pretty small and slight person. I have still not recovered from my astonishments, and if I were a proud person, I should be feeling humiliated at having been carried away. So that takes us to the winter of 1838, where the two of them, George and Frederick, decided to go to the island of Majorca in Spain, because Chopin's health hadn't been so hot, and they thought maybe like getting away from Paris would solve those problems. They didn't. There was also the problem of the people of Majorca being very Catholic, and Chopin and Frederick, <laughs> Frederick and George were not married, and they didn't like, the people didn't like the idea of George and Frederick shacking up under their roofs, so they were denied good accommodation, and Frederick had some doctors visiting him who he considered incompetent because he said, I had three doctors visit me, and the first said I was dead, the second said I was dying, and the third said I was about to die. Like many famous musicians, Frederick seemed to sort of feed off his misery, and he had like some really great output in that sad, horrible winter where he was feeling really crappy. He even wrote like the famous preludes among other pieces. But eventually George is like, hey, this is, this is horrible. Your health is getting worse. We are getting off this island. So eventually they returned to Paris where they continued to live separately, like in separate buildings. They never lived together. They liked to uh, maintain their independence. In 1842, when Frederick was 32 years old, it became pretty obvious to himself and everyone else that he had like a pretty serious illness and that he was not going to be long for this world. He was quoted as writing to a friend that he had to lie in bed all day long because his mouth and his tonsils were aching so much. Around 1846, George and Frederick's relationship started to go really downhill for a few reasons. So one of the main reasons being this. George Sand had two children, a son and a daughter, and they were like having some huge mother-daughter arguments and Frederick was siding with the daughter instead of with his girlfriend and his girlfriend didn't really like that. And George's son didn't really like Frederick because he saw him as kind of like a, comp a composition, a competition to himself and was maybe like a little bit jealous. The two of them didn't really share the same views or interests and they didn't really have a lot in common. And Frederick's health, health kept declining and getting worse and worse. So George ended up being more of a caregiver to him instead of a lover, which for most people breeds resentment. In friends, in letters to her friends, she even referred to Frederick as her beloved little corpse, which is not very flattering. And to seal the deal, kind of like the final straw for Frederick, is she wrote a story about a rich girl and a sickly little prince, and it's kind of like mirrored their life and was maybe a little bit too personal, so they ended up splitting ways. By the end of 1848, Frederick was officially pronounced terminally ill by doctors. And 
Yeah, that was pretty sad. But he still had friends come visit him, and he still taught the occasional piano lesson, so it's not like he was completely bedridden the whole time. Near the end, he requested that his sister Ludwika and her family come up to hang out with him in his final months, weeks, and hours. And now we're back at the story of his heart. So Frederick was terrified of being buried alive, so he requested that when he died, he'd be cut open, his heart be removed, and then taken to back to Poland. And Ludwika obliged, because what do you say to a brother when he's dying? You just kind of have to do it, even if it's creepy. And then he died. The day was October 17, 1849, and Chopin was 39 years old at his time of death. At his funeral, they played Mozart's famous Requiem, as well as a few compositions by Chopin, including his Prelude Number no. 4 and Number no. 6. Thousands of people came from all around to get to his funeral, but one notable absentee from his funeral was good old George Sand. So let's take a moment to talk about Frederick's personality. So by all accounts, he was very like small, slight, frail, and probably like, I assume like a sensitive and quiet person. And probably more of like the introvert personality, which makes a lot of sense when you consider some of the biggest influences in his life, like Franz Liszt and George Sand, both who had very like huge showy personalities. It's kind of like Chopin is like a moth to the flame. For their personalities. He didn't seem to have like a great degree of self-confidence and he seemed very like critical of both himself and others. And as the original emo kid apparently, this is one thing he's quoted as saying. He says, it is not my fault if I am like a mushroom which seems edible, but which poisons you if you pick it up and taste it, taking it to be something else. I know I have never been much use to anyone and indeed not much use to myself. Poor Chopin. In a letter to a friend in 1834, Franz Liszt had this to say about Chopin. Chopin is all sadness. Furniture is a little more expensive than he thought, so now we're in for a whole month of worry and nerves. Frederick also didn't really like to perform in public, and he did more so in his youth, probably out of necessity as opposed to love of performing, because later on, he sort of just, he stopped performing nearly as frequently. He only performed about 30 times, like in big halls in his lifetime. The rest of the time, he preferred to perform in salons, which are basically just like big parties for intellectuals, or even better, he really liked performing for friends in his own apartment. Despite people saying unfavorable things about Chopin's personality, he did have a admirers and people who respected him, including George Sand's daughter Solange, who was one of the few people at Chopin's deathbed. She reminisces about, reminisces about him that he was a person of great integrity, honesty, generosity, and total devotion. And that's, that concludes our discussion on Chopin and his history and his life and his times today. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for the, an upcoming video where we'll discuss the music of Chopin and get in depth and listen to some examples and stuff like that. Give it a thumbs up if you like history videos and I will catch you next time. All right.